Well, Sierra sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, welcome. I come to you now in this time and in this way to share with you uh, a short reading from the New Testament and also to tell you a little bit of a story about, uh, you know, God's love and compassion and power for, that is used in, our, in your religious tradition. So, uh, if you want to read, it's a very short reading, Acts 2, uh, 32 through 33. Just a little short verse here I want to just add to this little story. Acts, 30, Acts 2, 32 and 33. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from God the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you both see and hear. Here are the words of the book of Acts uh, in the voice of Peter. So, Over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk with many other Indian religious healers who have been used by Creator to intervene in the lives of, of people, both uh, Indian and non-Indian alike. And uh, one of the greatest challenges of being an Indian religious healer is uh, not being able to continue to share the lives of those who have been helped. You know, the people that come from their families, their communities, oftentimes in deep distress, and looking for uh, someone to help them out and, and as often is the case, you know, when they get that help, they go back where they came from. And so you don't get to, you don't get to watch them continue their lives and their journeys and see how what has happened to them has impacted the other people around them. And in one particular case, uh, as an example, I'm going to share one story that I've done many times, but. Uh, and of course, I've changed the name of this person to protect identity and all that stuff. And, but uh, let me tell you here about about uh, Sister Paula. Paula was a nurse, a hospital administrator uh, from South Central United States, and she was a, a product of the cultural and social influence of the doctrine of Christian discovery. She was raised in a conservative Christian church and uh, spent her life, you know, being influenced by her, by her mother to, to follow the, the social norms of social expectations. And so, you know, she was all about looking good and, and uh, being the, uh, the product of a of high society kind of thing. And so, the one challenge that she had in this uh, society in which we live is that she didn't have uh, large breasts. And apparently this was important to her mother that she looked really good and be attractive and be appealing to men and to uh, be like the beauty queen, you know, uh, image, which is, you know, the Cinderella image, the Cinderella story, influence, and so, uh, or Barbie doll, that's another one. But, uh, so at the, uh, at the early age of uh, 16, she had breast implants, the silicone breast implants. And, of course, uh, that, that made her immediately popular amongst the guys. And so, 
uh, she went forward with her with her life and uh, got involved in the, you know the, the high life of the big city of, of, of southern United States and uh, she uh, was, was in partying and dancing and having fun and, and of course going to church and doing doing what all uh, conservative well not all but many conservative Christian uh, Euro Americans do in the southern United States so in this sense uh, the outcome of that was that she became an alcoholic so in addition to being a nurse and a uh, in that field she was also struggling with addiction issues when I met her when she came to me, uh, her breast implants had ruptured several years earlier, and all the silicon had leaked into her body. And she was in recovery. It had been for, and for a number of years. I don't know exactly how many, I don't really recall. But she was in recovery, and she was dying. And, uh, you know, following in the ways of the influence of mainline society and the, and the, uh, the edicts of the Dr. McPherson discovery, she, uh, she had never had children, you know, she had been all about herself, very egocentric, uh, very self-serving, and uh, very money-oriented, very materialistic, uh, as she had been raised to be. So, uh, it, but... So the silicon had penetrated her entire body and saturated her entire body, so much so that she was in a great deal of pain and, uh, and was on uh, permanent uh, medical disability. But she was also in a state of hopelessness and helplessness. You know, being a nurse, she knew all the ins and outs of hospitals. She was a hospital administrator, so she knew Western medicine. And she had, had tried to get help, but there was nothing anybody could do. And she had come to northern New Mexico to, uh, to basically to live out the rest of her life. And uh, she was married, but again, she had no children. And her greatest desire when she came to me was, you know, she told me, she said her condition was, was fatal and she knew it and, and she had tried to have many children but because of the silicon had saturated every cell in her body, uh, she, she had had numerous miscarriages and was unable to conceive or, that, or to bear, you know, go full term. And, uh, and this was very painful for her emotionally. And when she came to me, we said, and looked into what was going on, how she had come to this situation, and uh, her desire was unusual. Usually, when people come to me for, for a cure, it's because they want to, they want to themselves to stay alive. And, uh, and of course, we have to look into these things to see if it's okay for us to intervene before we can do anything. And in that case, you know. Uh, in her case, she didn't. She wasn't concerned about living. But her primary concern was she wanted to have a child to carry on the family legacy, the family lineage, and uh, you know uh, that was uh, that was highly unusual. And I had to think about that for a little bit uh, and sat with it. But uh, you know. Uh, the outcome of it was is that uh, because of that request, where she was not so much thinking about herself as she was others and her family and thinking about carrying on the line, you know, the uh, Creator had, had compassion and had pity on her. And we know that God has the ability to do great and wondrous things. You know, this passage, this two little verses I just read here, uh, whatever your position might be, but from, you know, speaks about how God raised Christ from the dead. And so we know, you know, God has done this many times for many prophets in the, 
as in, we know this in, in the Hebrew Bible, we know this in the stories, our cultural stories and our traditions, you know, you hear all kinds of stories from all of kind of cultures around the world where God does intervene in this way. And so we know that God has that power and, and that's the one striking characteristic of, of Paula was that she believed that God could do this for her through somebody like me. And I just happened to be there. So uh, her faith was strong. And her conviction, conviction was strong. And her desire was strong. And in that sense, uh, since she had such great belief and, uh, and came in a good way, uh, God uh, gave me permission to, to help her out. And this was not an easy thing to do. Just so you know, it was not an easy thing to do. Especially given that she was in her 40s, and women know that uh, you know, trying to give birth to a, a healthy child in the 40s is very high risk. And so, uh, what was involved was uh, uh, a lengthy process of intervention. But then God went the extra, extra step. The Spirit spoke to me and said, well, it's not going to do much good for her to give birth and raise, have a child and for that child to be abandoned through her death in that way. So, God instructed me to, to doctor on her first and, and get rid of a lot of that silicon out of her body so that she would be okay and then allow her to go through the, the process of giving birth to a healthy child. And so that's how it went. That's how it went. That's how it came about. Uh, over the process of, of seven, seven weeks, uh, Crater uh, was able to remove the, much of the vast majority of silicon from her body. And then through uh, doing ongoing uh, support for the child in the womb during that uh, following nine months, because in that seven weeks that I was doctoring on her, she conceived. And then so we continuously, every week, all the way through that whole nine period to make sure that there wasn't any crumbs on damage and all this other stuff. Everything went in a good way. And the child was born. The child was born healthy, a boy. And I got to watch him uh, grow up for a few years and then they moved away. And so, uh, and there were, there were some other things that go on in that, you know. Uh, part of the challenge of uh, people in recovery is that sometimes their, their level of emotional maturity gets stunted. It takes a while for folks to grow up when they're in recovery. And so, you know, things get, get, things get real interesting as, as they're want, you know. And so uh, when it comes to drama, there's no shortage of it here in, in mainland North America. So mainland culture in North America, there's a lot of drama. And so, but the point being is that uh, God did intervene and did help her out. And God can do the same for others. And I'm not saying that uh, it's required or necessary, but if there's something going on in your life that you're struggling with, that you're wanting to be, uh, wanting to get fixed, you know, you have to think about what's your motive. Are you just thinking about yourself? Or are you thinking about others? You know, Christ went on the cross, suffered and died for others, not for self. And Paula came to me in this way, not for self, but for others. And so, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? I've had a lot of people make all kinds of promises to me that I knew they had never had any intention of keeping. And sure enough, after they got what they wanted, they went right back to their old ways. And that's really a downer, you know. It, it makes you want to step back and say, why am I doing this? 
So before you even think about coming to a new religious healer, or going to a new religious healer, or asking God for help, it would be good for you to check your motives. To get that serious, to look in your heart, and to ask yourself, why do I want this to be fixed? Why do I want this help? Why do I want God to intercede on my behalf? When you think about these things, you think about this story. Do a little inter, you know, self-examination in your life. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you living your life the way you're living your life right now? And is it about being in service? Because that's what this is all about. Our in your religious tradition is all about being in service. Think about this. Walking beauty. Bye.